Acts 28. I'll read in the Derby version. Sometimes I'll refer to the King James. And when we got safe to land, we then knew that the island was called Melita or Malta. But the barbarians showed us no common kindness for having kindled a fire, they took us all in because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. And Paul, having gathered a certain quantity of sticks together in a bundle and laid it on the fire, a viper coming out from the heat seized his hand. And when the barbarians saw the beast hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man is certainly a murderer whom though saved out of the sea, Nemesis has not allowed to live. He, however, having shaken off the beast into the fire, felt no harm. But they expected that he would have swollen or fallen down suddenly dead. But when they had expected a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, changing their opinion, they said he was a god. Then verse 7, Now in the country surrounding that place were the lands belonging to the chief man of the island by name Publius, who received us and gave us hospitality three days in a very friendly way. And it happened that the father of Publius lay ill of fever and dysentery, to whom Paul entered in and having prayed, and laid his hands on him, cured him. But this having taken place, the rest also, who had sicknesses in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and on our leaving they made presents to us of what should minister to our wants. And after three months we sailed in a ship which had wintered in the island, an Alexandrian with the Dioscuri for its ensign. And having come to Syracuse, we remained three days. Whence, going in a circuitous course, we arrived at Rigium, and after one day, the wind having changed to south, on the second day we came to Puteoli, where, having found brethren, we were back to stay with them seven days. And thus we went to Rome. And thence the brethren, having heard about us, came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and Trestaberne, whom, when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered up the prisoners to the Praetorian prefect, but Paul was allowed to remain by himself with the soldier who kept him. So far the reading of the scriptures. So, when we studied the storm, we have seen God's hand. And our brother mentioned in prayer also that God is really in control. And that's what we have seen in chapter 27. That God is in perfect control. And also, we are reminded of Romans 8.28, that God makes all things work together for good for those who love God. That is an object lesson. In that sense, we see that difficult things are used by God to do good to the believers. And so we have seen the good hand of God, and not only for the believers, uh, it had an impact on all, that all uh, arrived there safely, on land. At the end of verse 44, and thus it came to pass that all got safe to land. It's interesting that this verb, it's used uh, to uh, safely arrive or be saved, it's really to be saved through something difficult. It's used for uh, Noah and those who were in the ark who went through the waters of the flood and were saved through the waters. And here this word is the same word as in First Peter 3. So they arrived safely. They had gone through the storm, and now they arrived safely to land. 
And that same word is picked up then in Acts 28 verse 1, when we got safe to land. In the King James it says, when they were escaped. It's, um, it's uh, just a little bit of a paraphrase, but literally it is, they got safe through all this, and then they found out, or they knew, that the island was called Melita or Malta. Malta is really from the Phoenicians. I did really have to uh, say a little bit about that. You know, the Phoenicians, they were um, very well known uh, all over the seas. Uh, actually, about 300 years before Christ, they had already mapped Antarctica. So they had gone around Antarctica and they had mapped it already. They were uh, incredible how um, very able sailors they were. And they mapped the whole world. And so, a lot of this research got lost when the um, university in uh, Alexandria got burnt, or the library in Alexandria got burnt. They lost a lot of these materials. But they were very able people. And they used Malta <coughs> as a stop on their journeys. Malta was very well situated there. And so Malta is really a name given by the Phoenicians. And it means... Uh, escape or something like that and then we come to verse 2 the barbarians now when we speak about barbarian it's very negative has a very negative sound to it a connotation but in the Greek world in those days the word barbarian was used for people who did not speak Greek so they may, may be very cultivated and yet they are called barbarians because they don't speak Greek. That is really the meaning of the word here in this context at that time. And it means the people were speaking their different dialect that the people in the Roman Empire did not understand or the Greek would not understand it. But Paul may have been able to understand because this uh, Phoenician dialect is also closely related to the language, the Hebrew language or the Aramaic language and so on. So there was, uh, perhaps they were able to talk with these people. And what is interesting, it says, they showed there's no common kindness. You see in verse 2, in the middle of verse 2, um, they showed there's no little kindness. And that is something that often happens in Luke's writings when he says um, no little kindness, it really means very great kindness and that is uh, uh, a way that Luke often writes using terms like this no little it means very great and um, the word kindness is really where we have the word philanthropy come from and this word is used also for God in uh, Titus the uh, kindness of God reached us, Titus 3, it's explained. So that is the loving kindness of God, His love for mankind. That is what it really means. And these barbarians, who were not believers, they were pagans, but they showed a great kindness. And that was also, uh, we'll see a few more details about that, God's provision. See, there were other uh, nations if uh, the people from a shipwreck would land there, they would just be killed, and then the people living there, they would just take all their possessions. So this is another example of God's hand watching over them. We've seen in chapter 27, the tremendous dangers that Paul had to face. Uh, one time he saw that the sailors wanted to escape the ship, and though he warned the centurion that if the soldiers, if they would escape, then uh, they would get stuck. They would ha uh, lose the help of the sailors. And so the soldiers came in between. They cut down the, um, the lines there. And so uh, the soldiers could not escape. So there was one danger. Then we have seen at the end also that they wanted to kill the prisoners. Why? Because... Um, the soldiers were responsible with their own lives for those prisoners. If those prisoners would escape, then they risked to be killed themselves. But then we have seen the centurion who had started to appreciate Paul. He defended Paul and he took 
that risk on him, he could have been, if they would escape, then even the centurion could, could be killed. But God watched over all of them, he provided, and so another tremendous danger uh, was passed there. And now in chapter 28 we'll see other dangers. Not only that the population was very kindness instead of uh, uh, very rough, they were very kind, it was God's provision. Then also we will see another example of God's provision in a few moments. And so this kindness that we find here by the uh, people who are living there was an uncommon kindness. And uh, what we see then when the rain was coming down and it was also cold, they uh, made a fire. And so that was the population there was involved to get that fire going for those 276 people. But then we see in verse 3 that Paul also, and that means also the others who were with them, of course, were helping to get that fire going so that they could get dry. And a lesson here that Paul himself got involved. He did not say, well, I leave that to others. I am the great Apostle Paul. No, there was no, no kind of uh, attitude like that. So, the same kindness that we see with this population who did not know God, we see that kindness also with Paul and his attitude to be involved and help to get this fire going. And then something happened. I said there were dangers that uh, passed and now is another danger. All of a sudden, out of that bundle of sticks, a viper comes out and bites him. That was a vicious attack. And I think that is an illustration of the enemy who was there. The enemy didn't want Paul to arrive in Rome. The enemy wanted to get rid of Paul. The sooner the better. But you remember that the Lord said to Paul in Acts 23 verse 11, after he had testified before the Jewish council, the Lord said in a vision at night, he stood by him, he stood with Paul to encourage him, and he said, as you have testified here in Jerusalem, so you must testify of me in Rome. So that was what the Lord had told Paul, and Paul knew therefore that he would arrive there. We have seen during the storm that he uh, knew that he would get there, but he did not know at some time that all would uh, get there in safety. But then the angel confirmed that all would get there in safety, and it was really because Paul had to get safely to the shore. That's why the others got saved also. But now there's another danger, because this viper was a poisonous a serpent and so Paul would die quickly if the Lord would not have come in now the enemy is sometimes compared to a serpent where you have the idea of uh, as you have in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 of, uh, of seduction but the enemy is also compared with a dragon who devours is compared with his, his name is Satan which means opposer, and that's what we see here also. By this attack, he opposes Paul, and it happened many times, and he's also the devil who puts everything in turmoil. But whatever he does, whether it is this way or that way he tries to oppose, he will not succeed, because God is in control, and we saw that earlier in the storm. And then I want to refer also to Mark 16. In Mark 16, the Lord had said to the disciples about the ministry that they would have after the Lord would uh, be gone. In Mark 16, He gave these instructions to the disciples. That was after the resurrection of the Lord, just before He went back to heaven. In verse 15, And He said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs, verse 17, shall follow them that believe. In my name 
shall they cast out demons, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so what we see here now is just an example of the fulfillment of this promise. We have to be careful. Mark 16 does not say that everyone who would believe would have all those features, would speak in tongues, would uh, do healing, uh, if he would drink something poisonous, would not hurt. That's not what it says. It says these signs will follow them. Very, in, very general. It is true that uh, all these signs were seen also in Paul's life. Like he was exposed to so many dangers and the Lord protected him. And so these signs were fulfilled in the Apostle Paul and in others also. Um, but the passage does not mean that now everybody who is saved has to do these things. Um, people who claim to speak in tongues, they say everybody speaks has to speak in tongues. But that's not what this passage says. These signs will follow them in a very general uh, way. And so if someone would uh, claim you have to speak in tongues, otherwise you are not a true believer, then you can say, well, did you already... Uh, meet the poisonous snake and did you survive that? if you want me to do that then you have to do that too did you drink something poisonous and survived it? so you cannot generalize it that this has to happen to all it happened to some for sure some have survived these attacks of the enemy in, in, Paul, in Paul's case you see that he attacked all those that he survived all those different forms of attack of the enemy I just want to uh, mention that to your co consideration. And then we go back to Acts uh, 28. When this poisonous serpent had uh, seized Paul's hand, the barbarians saw it in verse 4, and there was the beast was hanging from his hand, so it was really attached to Paul. It was a very dangerous situation. And then what they said, this man is certainly a murderer. And now he has escaped from the sea, but now Nemesis, that is the goddess of justice, is uh, getting him. That was their reasoning. He must be a murderer. Well, we know that was, that was not true. Maybe when Paul was a persecutor, he had put people to death, not as a murderer. They went through process, or whatever it was, but... Yeah, maybe you could call him a murderer in that sense, but as a believer, he certainly was not guilty of murder. But secondly, um, God's ways are different. If someone is guilty of murder, he becomes a believer, it doesn't mean that now this man needs to be uh, put to death. If the law demands that, yeah, then that may, be, that may happen, and it is under God's government that it is possible that that would happen. But what they refer to is not the human government, they refer to uh, a, a, a goddess. And so they were really in uh, pagan thinking with this goddess before them, and there was a form of superstition. So that was their reasoning, that the goddess does not allow him to live. By the way, this word allow, to allow, the verb to allow, or to permit, is used seven times in the book of Acts. But then when they kept looking in verse 5, what happened? He shook off that beast from his hand in the fire, so the serpent was gone. And that's an illustration also how Satan will end. These attacks will not go forever. The serpent will not be there forever. He will be in the lake of fire, Revelation 20. And in the day of grace in which we live, the Lord sometimes uses the believers to stop the activity of the enemy. You see that in Romans 16. So the activity of the enemy is stopped here by God, using Paul. And so the enemy did not succeed to uh, have Paul killed or to stop him. That was it. That was an, uh, that was an other attack, as we said. Uh, Paul had to face many different attacks. Now, an application for us, we 
are under attack, like Christians in general are under attack. Whether it is by the lion in persecution, the roaring lion, whether it is by the bear, you know, in David's story that he had fought the lion to protect the sheep, he had fought the bear to protect the sheep, and so the enemy attacks also today. The Christians in the, in the Western world, they are attacked by the bear. The bear would squeeze his prey, he would even notice it, no noise. And that's how in the Western world people are um, attacked by the enemy in a very subtle way. The roaring lion, you see in the uh, countries where there is persecution, so the enemy has those different attacks. But the Lord is able to protect his people, and he does protect his people. Sometimes he allows this attack to take place and that people get killed, but nothing happens by chance. It's all under God's control, as we said earlier. God is in perfect control. But we have our responsibility, and we have seen that last time also, to put our trust in the Lord, to rely on him. And that's for all of us. Whatever the situation is, we need to put our trust in God. And that is what Paul always did. He put his trust in God. The Lord protects him. He knows he has to go on to Rome. He will get there. And so this attack does not succeed. The serpent dies in the fire. And then what happened? The uh, barbarians there, the people of the island, they were watching for a long time. And then they saw that nothing unusual happened to him and what did they do and they changed their mind and they said there must be a God well the first conclusion that he was a murderer was wrong the second conclusion the opposite was also wrong he was not a God that happened another time in Paul's ministry that he was uh, in Lycaonia with, uh, with uh, Barnabas and then uh, a man had been healed miraculously and then the people thought that Barnabas and Paul were gods, like Apollos, Paul, he was speaking, and Barnabas represented Zeus, according to their thinking. That was not true, of course, but that is a similar situation. And then the Jews came and they incited the whole multitude, and then they stoned Paul to death. There, again, we saw an example how people can easily change their mind from one extreme to another extreme. And this is what happened here. They changed their mind from one extreme to the other extreme. And we know that both extremes were wrong. And that's an object lesson for us. Uh, sometimes we change our mind uh, completely, but we need to be careful. We have to really uh, consider things, what the Lord wants us to do. Paul was not taken by these wrong conclusions. Paul did not easily change his mind. He was stable. It was st and we need that stability in a world of changing opinions. Let me go to verse uh, 7. In the country surrounding that place, so now you are on this island, a bit further uh, in the countryside, there was a place where the, the chief man, uh, it says in the King James, yeah, the chief man also uh, of the island was, and he had his properties there. His name was Publius. Now, just a little comment here. Uh, uh, Luke is very careful in his writings. He is very exact. So here, the title of this man on the island was the chief. That's how he was called. Uh, sometimes we have seen other titles for Roman officials because this island, although it was uh, Phoenician background, was now under the control of the Roman Empire and so the Roman Empire was in control there. They didn't have a proconsul there or a proc procurator as in other places. They had this chief. That was his official name. Re really it means the first. That is the, how it was called. This man was called the first, that was his title, that was his position as a representative of the Roman Empire. So Luke is very exact in his description, and this man was called, the translated chief, but literally was called first. He was the first in this island, and then this man received us 
That's a very special term that Luke often uses, and it is connected with um, God's grace. Here God works in miraculous ways that this man would be very kind to them, to receive them. We don't know whether this whole crowd of 276 people was received on his property. Uh, us, that includes Timothy, uh, excuse me, Luke, who was there. So it was Paul and those who accompanied him on his journey to Rome. We have seen it at the beginning of chapter 27. And also Luke was included there. Because the us and the we in the book of Acts always includes Luke. And so this man gave hospitality three days in a very friendly way. Uh, King James said courteously. And this is the mentality that this man showed. The mentality is uh, an uh, attitude of friendship towards strangers. So he showed this uh, friendliness, this mentality of friendship towards strangers. And again, that is also under God's control that this happened. But another example of God's control is now in verse 8, where we see that the father of Publius was ill of fever and dysentery. It seems that that was a sickness that often was found there on this island because of certain conditions. And so Paul came in there and, first of all, he entered. So Publius must have talked to him about his father, that he was sick, and so Paul went in. Secondly, what did he do? He prayed. He was relying on God. He did not say, oh, I will take care of that problem. No. He prayed to know what God's mind was, what God wanted him to do. And then he laid his hands on him. So he identified with this man. Not to say hocus pocus or something like this. It is he identified with the problem. But you know, Paul was God's representative. Uh, excuse me. Paul was really the Lord's representative. The Lord in heaven had his representative here. And so when Paul uh, laid hands on this man, he did this also as the Lord's representative. The Lord wanted to use Paul to bring blessing. And the result was that he could cure him. He could heal him. The word that's used here, yeah, it's really he got cured from this disease. So there was a miraculous intervention. It was not Paul that healed that man. It was the Lord in the glory using Paul, Paul's hand, but the Lord healed that man. We have seen it in the beginning of the book of Acts, how Peter uh, identified with this man who could not... Uh, he was paralyzed, and he saw that he had faith, and in the name of the Lord Jesus, he told him, rise up. And he saw that this man was ready to respond to that call, and he, grab he seized his hand, identified, and then through the power, the Lord in the glory, through the face that this man had, through the face of Peter, this man was healed. We've seen it in chapter 3. It's a miraculous uh, case. And so... We cannot say that the Lord cannot do that anymore today. The Lord is able to do that. But if we claim, well, the Lord must do it, then we are wrong. It is up to the Lord. But here we see that Paul relied on the Lord and he prayed. And so the Lord must have given him then the conviction, yes, I'm going to heal this man. And so Paul went ahead, laid hands on him, and then the Lord used Paul that this man got cured. There was a miraculous intervention that the Lord worked through Paul's hands. But Paul is not here a, a healer like in the pagan countries where you have healers like that using um, satanic powers to do that. It was the Lord in the glory who used Paul to heal this man in a miraculous way. And then in verse 9 we see another word that's used for what happened next. Let's see in verse 9. This having taken place, so that was a tremendous testimony, others have heard about this, and so other people who had sickness, they also came. Uh, they had sicknesses, it's a word of ailments or weaknesses, that word has several uh, connotations. So people who were 
very weak or sick, they were brought there. It's interesting that this word sickness is used seven times in the book of Acts, seven times in the book of Luke, seven times in the book of Matthew. So it often uh, uh, is found. And so when this man was healed, it encouraged others to also come forward in their uh, needs. And then it says they were healed, but that's a different word. There's the word for therapy. You know, who was there? Look, he's a doctor. And he must have been involved because it says in verse 10, who also honored us. So Luke is included here. So here is healing, but not in the same way this miraculous healing of Publius' father, this Paul's hand. This is a different kind of healing. Perhaps Luke could give some medication or some advice that people should do uh, to be healed of their sicknesses. It's not necessarily a miraculous healing like in the case of uh, Publius. There was therapy given and they, uh, they got healed. And then in verse 10, I say this because God uses different methods. He can heal miraculously. He can also use cures. The Lord does both. And in verse 10, the response of the people in thankfulness who had been healed, they honored us. So they were very thankful and that's why they honored us, that is Luke and the people with him. Paul and all the others who were with Paul with many honors and not only that on our leaving they made presents to us of what should minister to our wants so they were so grateful that they provided for the next part of the journey so food and other provisions that they needed this population provided them so this kindness that we saw in verse 2 is now seen in a, in a double way, as it were, because of the healings that had taken place. So, it was, again, God's provision for them before they moved on. And so, perhaps we can ask ourselves this question, how does the Lord want to use me? Every believer has um, a possibility to serve the Lord. Like Luke was a doctor, he served the Lord. Paul served the Lord in different ways and so the question for each one of us how does the Lord want to use me? Young ones, older ones the Lord wants to use every believer for his uh, work and then in verse 11 after three months we sailed in the ship so we, so again there is Luke included and we have seen in chapter 27 how Luke uh, was very familiar with uh, sailing terms. He was a real sailor. He knew the sea, he knew the, those terms. He was very familiar with these things. He was also a doctor, and so this man was an all-round. He was a qualified doctor, he was a qualified sail sailor. He was, other things too, a good historian a good writer. It's amazing the many qualities that God had given him. And so now he sums it up after those three months of overwintering. You remember Paul had said they should have stopped in Crete and have overwintered there, but then he had gone through that storm. And I forgot to say that when they arrived there in Malta, this was about 360 miles uh, west of where they left in Crete. And so God had watched over them. He has led them to go in the right direction so that they w were further uh, on the journey. Uh, just God's hand is seen in this. And so God's hand of control, as you mentioned earlier, is seen in these details. And also in this new ship. Do you remember this is the third ship when Paul left from Caesarea, there was a ship that went uh, close to the coast until they were then put on a bigger ship, on a grain ship, that went then to uh, Crete. And ultimately that had the shipwreck before Malta. 
And now they have another ship that had overwintered there on the island of Malta. And it also came from Alexandria. You remember the other grain ship where they had the shipwreck came from Alexandria to bring grain to Italy. And this is one of those other ships that were used for those transports. And it gives here a detail in the King James it says whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Literally it says with Dioscuri as uh, ensign. That means the sign in front of the ship had two sides. You had one was Castor, the other was Pollux. They are the two sons of Zeus. Of course it's all connected with uh, uh, paganism. And uh, these were the signs that were used for the sailors. The sailors had the special sign in connection with those Dioscuri or the two sons of Zeus. They were supposedly protecting the sailors. And uh, so there's again superstition and sad to say uh, superstition also occurs under Christians. But that is not right of course. Superstition has to do with what is of the enemy. And so we should be free from that kind of superstition. But then in verse 12, they arrived there in Syracuse. Syracuse, already at that time, was a beautiful city. And I've seen pictures, I've never been there. But still today is a beautiful city. And so they, that's the southern part of Italy. And they remained there three days. So they didn't go there for sightseeing, they didn't have time for that. And then from there they left, after those three days... And it says in verse 13, going in a circuitous course. There's a term, again, that shows uh, how exact Luke is in his writing. It, it, in King James it says they fetched a compass, so they went around. It seems that because of the conditions in the sea, and uh, they had to uh, make a, kind of a circle to go on, and it was a pretty dangerous stretch. And so... That is why this term is used here. But they arrived safely in Regium. And after one more day, the wind having changed to the south, on the second day we came to Puteoli. And there we see something very special. In verse 14, it says, "Where having found brethren. So having found indicates that they were on the look. They had been looking for this, to find brethren. And when we go to a different country, it's always nice if you, uh, somehow, you find true believers. That's what they found out. He, they found true believers in this city of Puteoli, also in southern Italy. And then they were asked to stay there seven days. I don't understand exactly how that was possible, because the officer, the centurion, with the prisoners, was also there. And so, he, he must have said, well, we'll take a break here. It must have been with his uh, permission that they stayed there for seven days. And imagine also the seven days gave an opportunity for the, the soldiers, but also for the other unbelievers who were there, who had come from the ship and were also going uh, to Rome. It gave them an opportunity to hear the gospel. They must have used the time to have uh, meetings or whatever. We have no details. We only see that they were asked to stay with them for seven days. That implies a Sunday. Seven days always implies a Sunday. Whether it starts on Monday or whether it starts on Saturday, it always implies a Sunday. And so we have seen that also in Act 16, when Paul arrived there in, um, in Troas, there was also seven days, but there he left uh, on the on the Sunday. But we don't know what day it was, a Monday or a Wednesday they arrived there, but at least they stayed there for seven days, which includes a Sunday. So they had the opportunity to meet. And so we don't know if, if those soldiers or if some of those prisoners were also in, in their company. We, we don't have those details, but it is well possible. And then... The conclusion is in verse 14, thus we went to Rome. The we is Paul and 
Luke and his company, but it's like a conclusion. Now they are almost there. They are on the last leg of the trip to go to Rome. We went to Rome. It's almost like a dramatic statement. Now finally we are getting there. And then in verse 15, Thence the brethren, having heard about us, came to meet us. It's very interesting. This uh, I, I can't remember now how many miles it is, but it's, it's quite a stretch. From this point to Rome is quite a stretch. A couple of days' journey. 33 miles. 33 miles. Thank you. And so that was quite a distance. I mean, you have to walk it. But in the meantime, because they stayed there for seven days, so the report had gone out already to Rome that Paul was on his way. They knew it already before that, actually. And so now some went to meet him there. And uh, the word meet here in verse 15 is a very special term that is used for meeting high officials. Uh, two examples. In Matthew 25, the parable of the of ten virgins, they went out to meet the bridegroom. That was a very special occasion. It is used in connection with the rapture when we will meet the Lord in the air. The same word. We will meet Him. So that is a very special term to you to, used to meet a high official or a very special person, a high dignitary. In this case, it is in the rapture. It is of course the Lord. In this case, it is Paul, the Apostle Paul, and they wanted to meet him. So they went all the way from Rome to meet him here in Puteoli. So that's quite an effort on their behalf. And when Paul saw that, it is um, actually, I'm, I'm now mixing the two places. In Puteoli, he found brethren and they asked them to stay. But then when they went further on to Apiforum and Trastabene, there is where they met those brethren who came from Rome. So, from Puteoli, people went to Rome to tell that Paul was there. Then, from Rome, they went back to meet him in Appio Forum and Trastabene. That was already closer to Rome, of course, on the Via Appia. That was a highway that the Romans had built, which is in part still known today. And so, what it says here in verse 15, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. How wonderful! If we meet brethren, can we thank God? There are situations where people would act differently. But here you see how they loved one another, and Paul thanked God for these believers. And not only that he could thank God, we were reminded of Romans 8.28, that God uh, works makes all things work together for good to those who love him. That's how Paul could thank God, because God was in control. God had moved those brethren to go and visit him and meet him. But also it says <clears throat> he took courage. So Paul himself was encouraged here by the fact that these brethren came all the way down from Rome to meet him. That was for his encouragement. And so that is also a beautiful touch we find here. And this is how God would like to see us encourage one another. Like sometimes we cause problems to others. But the Lord wants us to be an encouragement for one another. And that is mutual, like it's both ways. And so this courage is something we find often in Paul's writings and also in Luke's writings. You remember that the Lord encouraged Paul when he was in Jerusalem and Paul uh, took courage when the Lord had shown him his thoughts. And so here, now he meets the brethren and he took courage. Of course, when we meet the Lord, when we think of the Lord through the scriptures, when he shows something, we are encouraged. The Lord, and he gives us courage. Some people get sick and somehow the Lord encourages them. And here is a different way how the Lord encourages Paul through the brethren who came to see him. And then in verse 16, when we came to Rome, it's again repeated that Luke is with him. Now they arrive in the city of Rome. 
Remember, Paul had talked about it a long time ago. Uh, he, when he was in Corinth, he wrote the epistle to the Romans. We have seen that when we were uh, studying earlier in Acts. That's a long time ago. And then also, uh, when he wrote the letter to the Romans, he expressed his desire to see them. But he said, I first have to go to Jerusalem. And then, when he was in Jerusalem, he got arrested, we have seen then. And now it's about four years after that, or well, about five years after he wrote that letter, he now arrives in Rome. And maybe the next time I'll say a little bit more about what happened after that. But here we came to Rome. So Paul's desire was fulfilled when he said in Romans 15 that he wanted to see them also and share with them. He had no idea that he would arrive there as a prisoner. But God fulfilled his desire and he arrived here in Rome, although as a prisoner. And the wonderful thing is, dear friends, we talked about God's control. God is going to use this for good. Um, Paul had not thought that he would arrive there as a prisoner, but God used that so that now in Rome he could visit people, he would have um, the opportunity to meet people who otherwise he would never have met. For example, here is in the Praetorium, that is part of the Imperial Guard uh, in Rome. If he would not have been a prisoner, he would never have gotten there. While he was there as a prisoner, he has a soldier by him. It says in verse 16, Paul was allowed to remain by himself. I'll, I'll say uh, something about that in a moment. But now my point is, with the soldier who kept him. <clears throat> so, Paul was here in a chain. Uh, he was uh, not in very harsh conditions. Like when you compare that with his other Roman captivity described in Second Timothy, he was in very difficult condition, in a dungeon. But here he has the possibility to hire an apartment for himself. He had to pay for it himself. And while he was in this apartment, he had the soldier who kept him all the time. So he was always kept under guard. And God allowed that because the soldiers would rotate. There would be a soldier for a number of hours, and then there would be another soldier, and then another soldier. When Paul would write these letters, he would dictate it to Luke or to somebody else who was with him. And so these soldiers were witnesses of many things. Just as I said earlier, with these people who accompanied Paul and Luke on this journey to Rome, we don't know how many people, unbelievers, were exposed to things they had never heard before. And here we have the situation that these soldiers, many soldiers, because for during two years there had been uh, a rotation of course, and so these soldiers would serve there for a while and then they would be sent to another part of the Roman Empire, but in the meantime they had heard something of the Lord through Paul, of the Gospel. We can imagine how Paul used the opportunity. Paul was someone who could use the opportunity. I often don't use the opportunity that God gives. We better, we are not alert enough. Paul was alert. He used the opportunity that God gave. So there is a new soldier. He uses that opportunity. And the soldier witnesses also what's happening. He's dictating letters. He's receiving visitors. Many people came to Paul there to visit him. You'll see it at the end of this chapter, the next time, Lord willing. And so those soldiers were witnesses of this. And if you go to Philippians, I'll just read that in Philippians 1, verse 13, Paul says, we start at verse 12, Philippians 1, verse 12, so he is now in Rome, writing to the Philippians, I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. So why does he say that? Paul is now here a prisoner in Rome. You would say it's all over Paul. The great apostle Paul who could travel all through the Roman Empire. He can't travel anymore. So 
that's the end of his ministry. No, it is the beginning of a new part of his ministry. Because he says in verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace or the praetorium, uh, literally, and in all other places. So, through the contact with these soldiers and the high officials, Paul um, had to give an account, probably several times, and so he met the soldiers, he met other high officials in the um, Roman guard here, and so God used that to reach out to others. And we see in Philippians at the end that he writes that the people of the household of Caesar gave greetings to the brothers in Philippi. So that means through the contact that Paul had with these people, he met here in prison, uh, several had become believers, and now they ask to send greetings to the believers in Philippi. In uh, chapter 4, verse 22, he refers to that when he gave greetings to the Philippians, all the saints, so who were with him in Rome there, salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So that shows how the gospel had now penetrated this, through this Praetorian guard and even the household of Caesar. It doesn't mean that Caesar himself, Nero himself at that time, was uh, uh, w would meet Paul. Probably that was at the other captivity in first, uh, Second Timothy, but here it was the household of Caesar, which was of course a huge, huge uh, household. Many, many people were involved in this household. And so there had be, uh, people had become believers. And so that is how we see how God used this situation in an unexpected way to reach out to people who would otherwise never have been reached by Paul or by the gospel. And so it says in verse 16, to go back to Acts 28 verse 16, Paul was allowed to remain by himself. So that means, if at the end of the chapter we'll see that, that he was in his own apartment. In verse uh, 30, he remained there two whole years in his own hired lodging or apartment and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all freedom unhinderedly. we we'll talk about that the next time, Lord willing. But the point is now here, that although Paul was in a chain, he had liberty to receive visitors, to speak to them, and we will see more about that the next time, Lord willing, when he invited the Jewish leaders. And so he was there by himself. Now, to be there by himself, he had to pay himself the apartment, he had to pay himself for his food, and that is why the Philippians sent uh, support, uh, we, we refer to the epistle uh, to the Philippians, they had sent support to Paul, and he received help also from others, so that he could support himself while he was there in this home, in this apartment, as a prisoner. And so, we'll stop here, and then the next time uh, we'll see how Paul then invited the Jewish leaders and gave an account to them. But what we can see here, a very practical lesson for us today, how in difficult circumstances God wants to use his people. Some get into a hospital, difficult circumstances, and God wants to use you there. Or you have to change a job and you find a difficult boss, but God uses these circumstances for our good. We've seen that in Romans 8. And he also uses these circumstances to, that we are able to reach out to others that we never would meet otherwise. And Paul is real, really the example of this. And also, when we look over this whole chapter, we see God's hand. God's hand was wisdom. And in closing, I just want to mention that it struck me uh, of late, that when you study the Old Testament, you have the term hand breath. You find the hand in connection with the table of showbread. The hand is there. It is an indication of God's protection. This hand of God that you cannot see, but his hand was there to protect Paul, to lead him. God's hand, his invisible hand, was there. It was a reality. And so, for us today, for the believers today, in countries where there is persecution, or in countries where it is 
totally different, like in the Western world, we need God's hand with us. Because without the Lord we cannot do anything. He says, without me you cannot do anything. We need His hand, we need His protection, we need His guidance, we need His support. And so, may we cast ourselves on Him, as Paul did, as Luke did, and may we go on as His witnesses until He comes to take us home. We refer to the rapture, then we will meet the Lord in the air. In the meantime, he'll have, He has a job for us, wherever we are. May the Lord bless His word. So if there is a question...